brought to Frosty Freeze and then right What was Frosty Freeze? Oh, I forgot. The Frosty all right. Good morning. Yeah. Good morning. Good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to our Malibu Planning Commission regular meeting for Tuesday, October 2nd, 2023. May I please have a roll call, Rebecca? Commissioner Hill? Here. Commissioner Jennings? Here. Uh, Commissioner Smith? Here. Vice Chair Mazza? Here. Chair Peak? Here. We have a quorum. Thank you. Norm, will you kindly lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Good call. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible. Liberty and Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion to approve the agenda as staff recommends. Do I have a second? Huh? I will second that. All in favor of approving the agenda? Aye. 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 Okay. Rebecca, may I please have a report on the posting of the agenda? The agenda for the meeting was properly posted on September 23rd, sorry, 20, yeah, 2023. The amended agenda was properly posted on September 29th, 2023. Thank you. Uh, do we have any public comment online? There are no raised hands. Wow. Okay, we have no public comment. Director Mollica. Good evening, Chair. At this time, staff has uh, no comments this evening. Glad to answer any questions if you have them. Thank you. All right. Uh, gentlemen, who would like to start us off? Greg? Uh, sure. Yeah, I, I would like to take some minutes to talk about the comment, uh, the letter we got from Ann Ravel on financial conflict of interest. Um, given the source, it seems like we should probably assume that a formal FPPC complaint is coming soon. Um, if you do some Googling, you'll learn that she's something of a crusader for governmental transparency and fairness. She's been the head of both the FPPC and the Federal Elections Commission. She's on the faculty at Berkeley Law School. She's an expert on financial conflict of interest law. In recent years, she's been involved in similar issues in cities, including Hermosa Beach and Ojai, among others. So she looks at Malibu and sees that we have development decisions being made by some whose livelihoods depend on development. And it turns out that that's problematical under the Political Reform Act. I looked at it, the act is pretty complicated, but fortunately, um, Ms. Ravel points out in her letter that uh, the League of California Cities has a publication that offers guidance, and it presents the code in a way that's easier to understand, I think. And probably none of us are, here are sophisticated enough to have a definitive take on her complaint letter itself, but um, so I'll, I'll limit some observations to what can be gleaned from the League's guidance, which surely is reasonably objective. And I would recommend that council members read it because it, does tell a different story from what the city attorney has shared publicly with you. And I imagine in closed session two, based on some things that council members said in last Monday's meeting. For instance, the guidance explains that for a conflict to be present, there's no requirement that misconduct has occurred as we tend to think of it. There's no need for a quid pro quo. So the concept of innocent until proven guilty, as was invoked by several council members, is irrelevant. The conflict of interest law is not essentially about something you've done, but about who you are, about your economic position in the community. The guidance makes clear that if decision makers' job involves development-related contracts, and if they benefit more directly from development than do most others in the community, they're required to recuse from hearing development applications. And then since a lot of a planning commission's work is exactly that. If you'd have to recuse on most of the agenda, agenda, 
then you wouldn't be able to perform the duties of office. I, and I, now I recall that Council Member Bruce Silverstein said something along those same lines some months ago, but that uh, seemed to have fallen on deaf ears. So <laughs> what are the stakes? Um, any decision made that involves a conflicted commissioner, no matter how they voted, can be invalidated by a court. And now that the city is on notice, the city may be liable for damages arising from any decision that has been made involving a conflicted commissioner. So what's next? I want to quote a paragraph from the League of California Cities guidance. This is page 43. Quote, while the local agency council, and here I'll just substitute the city attorney. So while the city attorney may have his or her own opinion as to whether or not a material financial effect exists, it is ultimately up to the public servant, commissioners Peek and Smith, um, or a financial expert to determine this issue. In such circumstances, the city attorney is not in a position to directly advise the official that it is safe to participate in the decision. If the city cannot provide clear guidance that there is no potential for a conflict of interest, then the public servant should be advised not to participate unless the public servant first seeks and receives formal written advice from the FPPC, end quote. So on its face, that looks to be the path that Commissioners Peek and Smith are, are on now. The, the fact that a, a plausible complaint is being made, and I say plausible based on who's making it, means that the city attorney cannot say that there's no potential for conflict of interest, um, which is what he would have to be able to say for them to stay in the role, according to this at least what the League of California Cities says. So it would follow then that either they must resign or obtain the FPPC's written consent before continuing to serve. So, guys, it's, it's apparently, apparently it's entirely up to you whether you want to stay tonight or walk out or get it and or get an FPPC letter, and I expect you'll stay, but if you do, you do risk allowing any hearing you participate in to be invalidated. Um, and beyond that, I'd, I have not looked into what sort of other sorts of sanctions there may or may not be, but uh, you know that's something that the FPPC will tell you about when you contact them or if they contact you. And that's that's just kind of my uh, news on that item. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, we have two public comments that were I got them late, but Joe, why don't you come up? And Joe, you'll be followed by Norm. And if anybody else has a public comment, anything that's not on the agenda, please turn in a slip now. So on that note, after thoroughly going through the letter from Anne M. Ravel, former chair, California Fair Political Practices Commission, County Council of Santa Clara County, chair of the Federal Election Commission, and deputy assistant attorney of the general of the United States of Department of Justice, I have to ask you why Chair Peak and Commissioner Smith, are you continuing to put the council members who appointed you in jeopardy with the FPPC and have not resigned yet? The code sections cited by Mr. Vell in this letter clearly show you both have a conflict of interest in every case you hear on this commission, and thus they can be challenged at all levels. On Ms. Ravel's Wikipedia page, it states that the FPPC Ravel oversaw the regulation of campaign finance, ethics, and conflicts of interest related to office holders. So this is what she specializes in. She is an extremely accomplished and distinguished 74 years of Latin American heritage who now occasionally lectures at her alma mater, University of California, Berkeley. I have no idea how she was consulted on this matter, but we residents should be grateful for her help. I also personally submitted several cases as evidence to you, the Planning Commission, where you, Chair Peak, while a city council member, voted through projects where you had a foreseeable financial gain, which you did eventually and substantially profit from for 6701 Portshead, and a bias on this one and several other projects regarding the applicant and architect Doug Burgey, with whom you have a professional relationship, as well as voting through friends projects without disclosure or recusal. The future is full of finan potential financial gain for you both, which is why you vote everything through. Why would you both want this to more than likely bring about an FPPC violation for your council members who made your appointments and possibly you yourselves? 
Both of you have done work with Doug Burgey and recently voted through his environmentally damaging Malibu Inn Hotel project, which now can likely be considered void in a court of law due to your conflict of interest in more ways than one on it. Based on this alone, Malibu Township Council will be requesting this we return to the Planning Department and request your recusal. Virtually all the projects you both have voted on in the past and future can possibly all be voided. Why would the city and you both take such a risk in continuing in your positions? I requested at the very least this be discussed with the public at a city council as it is city conduct and not a lawsuit and the city council represents the residents and you planning commissioners are supposed to be representing us residents and not serving yourselves in the process. Since you commissioners have thus far refused to simply step down for the sake of our city. I listened to an interview of the last few days with Hans Letts and Anne Ravel, and she states that she will be filing the FPPC complaint against City Council Members Grisanti and Riggins. As I surmise in the past, this was a huge issue and most of you were complacent with it and now it's blowing up. I ask the city for transparency and accountability with regards to this issue so the residents' trust can be earned. And I do hope you both reconsider and step down so harm does not come to the reputation, professionalism, and the position of the council members who appointed you. This will prevent any future lawsuit against the city brought on by these violations. Thank you. Thank you. Norm? Thank you uh, for uh, listening to my comments, uh, commissioners. You know, the Planning Commission from time to time have had architects on, on the commission, and I'm happy to see them because they have a very deep understanding about how the development standards are to be, uh, to be interpreted and how they're to be applied. I'm sure that they have had homes built in Malibu. I don't see a conflict of interest. When it comes to grading, I'm happy that we have a professional contractor who does a lot of grading and a lot of development and construction in the city of Malibu, as well as other places throughout the state. I like to see people on the commission that have specific knowledge about what you're voting on. The same thing with Schuyler. Um, as a professional electrician, he understands an awful lot about development, about what's necessary, uh, to, uh, to complete a project, um, the issues associated with, with solar uh, panels, and on and on. Uh, so my, my comment tonight is that I like to see professionals on the commission because they have in-depth knowledge that other people don't have. And, and they make a very good decision because they know what's going on. And if they're asked to bid on a job later, that's fine. If they're not, that's fine too. Um, but you don't want a planning commission made up of people that don't know anything about land development. Thank you very much for listening. Norm, Norm, can I ask you a quick question? Yeah. Uh, I don't remember who the architects were that were on the Planning Commission. Could you remind me? David Brotman, David Brotman was one. There okay. was another one that, that did that as well. I forgot David Brotman. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. All right. Do you still have more comments? I, I just to uh, add to that, her letter expressly points out from the League of California Cities guidance that in, in the typical case, and not every city, not every economic, you know, it's not a cookie cutter, you have to look at the totality, but the nominal kind of starting point is that an architect is not uh, allowed on a planning commission. They, they have a specific example of that in the, the so, and so, you know, if, if an architect can't be, I, you know, I don't know about what other professionals, but that's what the league says. Okay, uh, John. Uh, way above my pay grade, I just have a question of our distinguished attorney. Is What I read was that under certain circumstances, past decisions can be challenged if certain things happen certain ways. In other words, if there's some suit and they say, no, you can't be on the planning commission. 
is there a way we can insulate jobs we are doing, our cases we're hearing now from that? For example, if it looks like a, a, a unanimous decision, can we just have three people vote uh, and have it pass? Or I'm just trying to not have to hear everything over again. I don't know how likely it is we would have to do that, but I'm just wondering if there's any way around it right now to figure it out. Sure. So I guess I'll answer that the last kind of question at the end in terms of how likely it is. To my opinion, it's insanely unlike, unlikely. Um, I can't tell you the specific statute of limitations for the variety of previous decisions that, that, that we've made. Um, but sure, anyone can sue the city kind of for any reason they want. We cannot prohibit them. Um, once again, the good thing that we are at the Planning Commission is that everyone always has an appeal right to the City Council. So should they feel that they did not get a fair shake or felt like your guys' decision was an error, they're more than, you know, they're, it's, the, the, it's built into the process in order for them to go ahead and appeal that. As it pertains to attempting to insulate ourselves, um, I would advise against that. Um, and once again, I know Commissioner Hill did, did point out that section in the California League of Cities, there, there, there was a bit more context to that. Um, I, of course, have always been in contact with Chair Peak and, and Commissioner Smith. Um, it's my opinion they are fully free to participate. It's been my experience with them. Any time I, I ever said, hey, it may be a good idea to recuse, they have readily done so, indicating that they are in no way purposely trying to place the city at risk. And, and doing anything but up here, but attempting to fulfill their roles as chair and commissioner respect, uh, respectfully. And so, so no, I, I, I would advise against that. They are up here. I cannot force them not to participate. If they want to vote on a certain project, that is their right and their duty as, as planning commissioners. My real question was, we have something like, we had something tonight and everybody's obviously gonna vote for something. It looks like everybody's gonna vote for it. Is it safer to have three people vote than five? No. Jeff. Thank you. A um, couple of things. First of all, the world of the FPPC is, um, like I said with John, it, it, it's beyond my pay grade. It's very intricate. Um, my own experience is that logic doesn't play a great role in it, but um, I read the letter that came in. There were two things missing that I thought were that struck me as strange. I mean, I've been practicing law for over 50 years. I don't think I've ever written a letter that doesn't say, I am so-and-so, I represent so-and-so on behalf of such-and-such -such or in such-and-such -such a connection. There was no statement in that woman's letter uh, indicating who her client was. Now, it's suggested that she's just a good-hearted, public-spirited individual who's out there looking to make sure that Malibu follows the rules. And um, yeah, um, if you believe that, <laughs> um, I, I won't touch on that any further. Um, but I've known Skylar Peak for a long time, is basically contemporary with my sons and I knew him when he was growing up. And, but I first associated with him when he ran for the city council. Um, and I, as strongly as I could, opposed his election to the city council. I, opposed, I supported his opponents, um, not because he was a contractor, but because I wasn't particularly fond of the people that were supporting him. Um, and when I look back, you remember that election. They, they ran as the slate. Uh, it was uh, Skyler and uh, Rick Mullen and Zuma J. Um, and I guess my question is for the people who are now trying to force Skyler off, where were you? I could have used your help in trying to get rid of him back then, but it turns out that you were supporting him then for an election for city council. I think if we went back and looked at the newspaper ads, we'd find John Moss's name, we'd find uh, Steve Uring's name as supporters. Um, so uh, in my view, this is, you know, I know we've got an election coming up against, and this is sort of, in, uh, 
Before I get to that for a second, I, 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 there was the other thing that was missing in the letter. And the thing that was missing in the letter was the statement that had been made repeatedly by these commissioners that they would refuse to bid on and not consider bidding on any matter that had come before uh, this body. And I know that there's an argument that, well, that's, you know, they're, they're in the industry, so it somehow re rebounds to their economic benefit if there's development that goes forward. And the problem with that argument is that it proves too much. I mean, if I'm an insurance man and I sit up here on the Planning Commission, um, that house gets built, it's going to need insurance, uh, opens up another possibility for me. If I'm a doctor or a veterinarian, you know, the people are going to move into that house and they might have a dog or they might have a kid that gets sick. And so that's going to work to my benefit. If I'm a lawyer, people, they're going to, maybe they're going to need a will. Maybe they're going to get in litigation and they're going to have to come to me. So there's, there's actually, if you follow that line of argument out, that any remote possibility of economic benefit is uh, sufficient to disqualify you, then you basically have to have a planning commission made up of people who have never done anything and don't have a career. Um, so that's that's my point about that. Um, so like I say, we're starting this, the election season. I get that. And this one, the subtitle of this one should be, if you thought that the Jefferson Wagner affidavit was a joke, wait till you see what we've got for you this time. So. Dennis. Um, wow. This is a... Uh... This is really something. I didn't. I thought my driveway was going to be my, my, uh, me being real popular, and everybody knew who I was. Just that thirty-five hundred foot driveway going at Tuna Canyon, but no. Um, I don't really have anything to say. I mean, I know who I am. I would never bid on work or try to get work. And too small a town. Um, the honor of sitting up here and being chosen is way over me trying to go get some work it's it's kind of funny that that they think that um but that's it i'm i know who i am and uh i just that just isn't going to happen would never happen thank you um i really do wish craig and uh, joe that you guys would say who is driving these arguments and you all sit there with your heads like spinning like you don't know who it is and I just think that you're lying straight to my face and I think that's so dishonest also seems dishonest to our community but in any event um, I will continue to serve on this I've obviously spoken with the city attorney and others about this I don't see the conflict that you're alleging at all um, I will never make a decision and have not ever made a decision on any project that somebody came to me and asked them, asked me to, to bid on them. Um, I think that in, I don't know necessarily Dennis's line of work because his is a grading contractor, sometimes is involved a lot earlier in a project than I am. Oftentimes your trades people are not elected on a project till far after even the plans go through building and safety. And most plans have not gone through building and safety when they're just coming here before the commission. So I just want that to also be to be put out there. And I'm going to turn it over to the city attorney if you need to address this any further. The only thing I, I would add is like any letter, complaint, allegation, whatever, whatever word you want to use, we take it very seriously. Miss Ravel will be getting a response letter um, sufficient in the context of her former position and the length and breadth of her letter. Um, I've reviewed the letter. My boss, City Attorney Russin, has reviewed the letter. We've reached out to our colleagues at our law firm who specialize in this with this with this topic. This is not something that we take lightly. This is not something that we get and say, ah, she doesn't know what she's talking about and ignore it. Um, myself and Com Chair Peak and Commissioner Smith, I hope you this is okay. Of course, upon hearing it, they immediately reached out to me and said, hey, what do I need to do? I, you know, this is very important to me. Um, and so with that, Chair, I will leave it at that and simply say that all, you know, all systems go. 
Go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I just thought it, it's an interesting and an important subject. I looked at the letter. I looked at the guidance because I could read that in a way that I can't read the code necessarily. And I thought it's inter interesting to talk about because on the one hand, it's not about the direct conflicts that I think you guys are focusing on, that you're not going to take the job or whatever. It is more about a broader participation in, in the economic community. And as for your comment about, like, well, if it's the insurance guy or the guy who writes the wills, there, there's, I, I don't know the details of it, but my sense is that there's a, some kind of calculus where you figure out, is this a material effect or is it not? It, 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 if you can't just say it's a slippery slope and anybody could benefit. There, there's some kind of is it substantive or not thing to discuss. And I guess that's beyond us, but I, I just wanted to say, you know, I'm just trying to look at it because I think the way the council looked at it to say, oh, innocent until proven guilty, well, I don't think that's what the letter is saying at all. There's, it's, not a, it's not an accusation of conduct. It's, a, it's more just about uh, something a little more ho holistic than that. Okay, John. I'm assuming that from this point forward, the only decision makers are, are, are the two count, uh, planning commissioners, their appointees, and the city council as a whole. It has nothing to do with us as a body. Is that correct? I, I apologize, Vice Chair Mazza. Could you repeat that question? I didn't quite. I'm assuming that from this point forward, the only people involved are uh, Dennis and Schuyler, the, uh, their appointers, and the city council in general, and nothing to do with the planning commission. Is that correct? So, in terms of so making you, any yeah. decisions from this point forward. Correct. So, so when you say decisions, I apologize. I, I thought you meant decisions as as the items that we are, no, are no, going to get to. Just now. just correct. about so, recusals. Correct. On that topic, Commissioner Hill did did kind of accurately cite that it is incumbent upon the official that is advice and statements I have made to Chair Peak and Commissioner Smith um, in the past. Um, and sure, it's my understanding that the Planning Commission serves at the pleasure of the City Council. That is entirely up to them if they would like to you know, make changes to their appointments. Um, so I hope that answers your question, but yeah, that's, that's that. Dennis. Um, it seems like I don't know that I agree with Commissioner Hill on that. It seems like if they're making accusations, as Council Member Riggins said the other night, it was it was a theory. I mean, it was nothing. There's no evidence of any wrongdoing. This that that doesn't make any sense. That it's we're just because we're contractors, we're guilty of of taking whatever, taking a job or money or whatever that would be. Um, I would think, as anything, that you would have to be found guilty of doing what they're telling us that we're supposedly doing and not just hypothetical, as Council Member Riggins said the other night. So um, can't, it doesn't make sense to me that, that you'd have that big a broad a picture of this and they didn't have something to pinpoint on and then go get you. So that's how I'm looking at it. And, and, and Chair Peek, um, if I just may, I don't want to, you know, I believe there was a speaker tonight who said that there may be a more formal FPPC complaint coming. That's, you know, to be determined. We'll see how um, Ms. Ravel, you know, wh what she thinks after our response letter. Um, but I guess I would cautious, you know, caution everyone that we're not going to litigate this here tonight. I understand you guys are all public servants and you want to, you know, make it known that you're up here with acting with integrity and honesty. I totally respect that. But getting into the nuance of the various FPPC regulations, advice letters is probably a bit esoteric for tonight and, you know, not going to really get us anywhere. All right. With that said, we're moving right along here. Um, we are on the consent calendar. Do I have anybody that wants to approve the consent calendar? I move we uh, uh, consent to the consent calendar. That sounds great. Actually, we need a, a, a motion to approve it since it's a minutes. I'll second it. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, Aye. there are none opposed. We are now at 5A, which is Coastal Development Permit number. 
Permit Amendment Number 22-007, an application to amend Coastal Development Permit 19-052 to remove the condition of approval number 22 of resolution number 21-39. Adrian. Just hi, good evening, uh, Chair Peek and, and members of the Planning Commission. Um, the subject uh, parcel is located towards the uh, west of Malibu Road on the inland side of uh, Malibu Road. Uh, the um, property is bisected by Bayshore Drive just north of the existing residence. The uh, Planning Commission recently approved an after the fact replacement uh, resident and associated development. Uh, the approval included a condition of approval to widen the entire uh, width of Bayshore Drive. While the fire department um, did not review the project because it considered a, a remodel, uh, staff uh, conditioned the project for uh, consistency with adjacent uh, new development. Uh, we later learned that the two adjacent residences were not uh, required to wind the road. Uh, the new wall uh, required to wind the road will result in uh, considerable cost to the owner. Uh, the owner is uh, concerned about uh, stabilizing, uh, destabilizing the slope adjacent to uh, the subject property and uh, existing road um, uh, widening will uh, uh, oh, excuse, excuse me, the existing road uh, width would remain consistent with uh, the width uh, in front of other adjacent single family residences. Uh, here's the uh, site plan. Uh, the improvements to the site uh, to the right were previously approved. Uh, the portion of the driveway depicted in red in this site plan is the portion of Bayshore Drive that, would, uh, that was conditioned to be widened. A new uh, retaining wall would be placed uh, to the north boundary of uh, the uh, red area as shown on the side plan. Um, in conclusion, uh, staff recommends that the Planning Commission adopt uh, resolution number 2341 approving the proposed amendment uh, to remove condition 22. And I'm available for any questions. All right, thank you. Uh, does anybody have any disclosures? None. 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 Uh, none other than participating in the original decision. Got right, it. as did I, as did John. Yes, that's true. So I did not participate in the original decision. And um, I did not review the original hearing. You want me to, we're good. No, nope, this is a CDP okay. amendment, it's not a continuation. Okay. Um, all right, so I have the applicant, is it Alex? And Alex, you have 15 minutes. <laughs> um, do you want to reserve any time? I, I, I will, I'll tell you, I, I plan to take maybe 15 seconds. Uh, <laughs> um, Alex DeGood, uh, Land Use Council for the applicant. Um, I, you heard in the very short staff report, this was just, uh, you know, understandably just kind of a factual mistake that was made at the time that the city thought that widening hadn't been imposed on, on adjacent residences when it hadn't. So now you have a situation where if you did it here, it would be actually strange that you'd have, you know, this cut out and, um, and you know, w would raise other geotechnical issues. So. I think that's pretty straightforward. I'm happy to answer any questions and reserve, but, um, but that's all we have. Okay, thank you. Thanks. And Matt and Wendy do not want to speak, correct? Do you, do you want to speak or no? No. No, okay. All right. Um, nobody online? There are no raised hands. Okay, you have a question? Yeah, Richard, uh, has this project been finaled? I'm not Richard Adrian, I wasn't even thinking. <laughs> that, that's okay. Um, the project is under construction, um, or I would say um, the permits have been issued, but they have not requested for a uh, final inspection uh, from building safety or from planning. 
Okay, I, uh, the only thing I want to make clear is I drove by today, as I do almost every day, from the highway. And it appears that condition number 26, which is they have to use native landscaping and they can't block PCH views above the highway grade, is in violation. So I just hope when you find, let you, you uh, check that condition number 26. If there are no other questions, I'll move for approval. I'll staff second it. Recommend. Staff recommends. All in favor? Aye. 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 We need a second. You got a second from Jeff. Okay. Aye. Do we have to do a roll call or just aye? You no. have unanimous. Okay. Unanimous decision, Rebecca. Thank you. I think that's the first time we haven't had to have a rebuttal, so that was good. <laughs> Um, all right, we're now on 5B. This one's going to take a second for me to read. So, Lechuza Beach Public Access Improvements Project, CDP number 7-087, mitigated negative declaration number 19-001, and initial study number 19-001, conditional use permit 21-010, Variance number 22-022, 21-023, and 23-029, and sign permit number 19-004. An application for public access improvements at Lechuza Beach to improve accessibility consistent with the Americans with Disabilities Act, including installation of a new ADA accessible single stall restroom, on-site wastewater treatment system, gate access improvements, ADA van parking space and access aisle, and reconstruction of existing view platforms and staircases, including a conditional use permit for an OWTS to be located on separate properties, variances for locating improvements on a steep slope, for a reduction in the bluff top setback, and for retaining wall heights in excess of six feet, and a signed permit for the installation of information signs. The location of this project is 31720 and a half Broad Beach Road. And there's a lot of different APNs and folks involved. <laughs> um, so are we going to go with Adrian? Richard. You'll have me on this one. Okay. Adrian right. will be working with me on it, though, okay. both of us. All I'll right, give cool. the presentation. Good evening, Chair Peak and members of the Planning Commission. As discussed, Item 5B is for the construction and installation of public access improvements to Lechuza Beach to improve uh, the accessibility in the area, as well as you mentioned, to make it uh, ADA compliant. The project was originally submitted in 2007, but was delayed for several years due to a lawsuit between MRCA and MIHOA over access rights. MIHOA is the local HOA. MRCA and MIHOA reached a settlement agreement in 2018, which included a beach management plan, which is included as attachment number six in your agenda packet this evening. The beach management plan outlines the rules for use of the access improvements, maintenance, repair responsibilities, and addresses other operational items. The beach management plan has also been made a condition of the CDP. The project, as you mentioned, includes an initial study and negative declaration, which was prepared by MRCA acting as the lead agency under CEQA. The MRCA Governing Board adopted the initial study negative declaration on May 1st, 2019. As the responsible agency under CEQA for the project, the Planning Commission must determine whether the proposed project is consistent with the final negative declaration prior to acting upon or approving the project this evening. If I may have the next slide, please. The project site includes four different neighbor, uh, four different project areas within the Broad Beach and Malibu Incidental neighborhood. The project areas include existing beach access improvements, including pathways, gates, viewing platforms, signs, and staircases. A related coastal development permit was approved in project area one in 2020 
for the widening of the driveway between Broad Beach Road and West Sea Level Drive as required by the fire department. That CDP expired earlier this year, although the applicant still intends to pursue the project. If I may have the next slide, please. This slide shows proposed improvements in each of the four project areas. Project Area 1 includes the existing pedestrian and vehicular access gates on West Sea Level Drive, just off of Broad Beach Road. Improvements in this area would include adding an ADA key punch pad at the vehicular gate and replacing signage. Project Area 2 is located at the beach terminus of West Sea Level Drive. Improvements in this area include expanding a fire department turnaround, adding ADA accessible van parking space, and access aisle. In addition, there's the replacement of the pedestrian gate, viewing platform, beach staircase, and signage. Project Area 3 extends from the existing pedestrian gate at Bunny Lane to the beach improvements uh, below. The Improvements include replacing the gate with a decorative gate, improving the pathway, adding a bike rack, replacing the viewing platform and beach staircase. In addition, there will be an accessible single stall beach restroom and OWTS, as well as a replacement of signage. In addition, the existing fire department turnaround at the terminus of East Sea Level Drive would be improved with a new accessible van parking space and access aisle. In addition, the leach fields for the OWTS would be located in this area. Project Area 4 is located at the pedestrian and vehicular gate at Broad Beach and East Sea Level Drive. Improvements in this area include adding a key punch pad for ADA vehicles and replacing signage. If I may have the next slide, please. As discussed by the chair, the project includes a conditional use permit for the leach field and OWTS to be on separate properties, a variance for construction on slopes steeper than two and a half to one, a variance for construction on a coastal bluff, a variance to address retaining wall height. This was an issue when the item was last continued and also a sign permit for the informational signage. If I may have the next slide, please. Uh, these are photographs of some representations of the project site. The slide on the left shows the pedestrian and vehicular gate located at West Sea Level Drive. The slide in the middle shows a portion of the pedestrian access way leading from Bod Broad Beach Road to Bunny Lane. And the slide on the right shows the restroom story poles in Project Area 3 uh, that were installed on May 11th. If I may have the next slide, please. As mentioned earlier, this is uh, project area one and the existing pedestrian gate and vehicular gate at West Sea Level Drive, just off of Broad Beach Road. These areas would be improved with a new gate, ADA access punch pad and replacing the signage. Next slide, please. This slide shows a close up of the project area two improvements, including the expanded fire department turnaround, the ADA accessible parking space and access aisle, viewing platform and beach staircase. Next slide, please. This slide shows the project area two staircase that would replace the existing stairs in the same location. This project area also includes a replacement retaining wall that exceeds the LCP's six foot maximum. The current retaining wall is approximately seven feet, three inches in height and the proposed reconstructed staircase requires lowering the landing by approximately five feet. As such, the proposed reconstructed retaining wall will extend downward, resulting in approximately an 11 foot, eight inches plus or minus tall wall. Overall, these improvements are located above the beach elevation and allow for access improvement to occur as shown in this image. Next slide, please. This slide shows a close up of the beach stairs, restroom, wastewater system and viewing platform that are located in area three. Next slide, please. 
the purpose of this slide is to depict the new proposed pedestrian gate and uh, the signage that you'll be seeing at the Lachusa Beach access in Area 3. Next slide, please. In this slide, we have a close-up of the beach stairs, restroom, viewing platform, as well as the ADA space. Next slide, please. This is project area four. This is the gate at Broad Beach Road and East Sea Level Drive. And in this area, there will be a new gate and ADA access. Or pardon me, uh, just signage and the ADA uh, keypad. Next slide, please. I believe that is correct, yes. All right, so they're just doing the keypad and the signage. Yes. Not changing the gate. Correct. Okay. Uh, last week, staff received correspondence from MRCA with the concerns of some of the comments that are attached to the project. And what you have here is the condition above and then below the comment from MRCA, the applicant on the project. I believe that there is some confusion in their request on this comment. They asked that the coastal development permit be changed from a three-year expiration date to five years to match with the beach management plan. However, uh, the, the way that the permit is written, there would be three years for MRCA to act on the permit and the beach man management plan is a separate issue. That's something that would start up once the, the permit has been acted on. Um, the, the two uh, appear to be separate. However, should the, count, uh, the commission tonight like to make the permit have additional years uh, for to be valid, uh, that would be up to the planning commission's discretion. Next slide, please. Uh, the purpose of uh, MRCA's concern here was that uh, there may be potential assessment of fees associated with this project. Uh, these are our standard conditions to any coastal development permit where we state that any revised plans uh, may require additional fees for review by the planning department. In addition, as a catch-all, we also put a condition on all permits uh, that outstanding fees must be paid to the city prior to the issuance of any building permit or grading or, or demolition permits. The planning commission, or excuse me, the city council, and uh, if needed, our assistant city attorney can, can speak to this point, did provide direction to staff that pursuant to a recent state bill that public access projects, the city would process those at no fee to the public agency. Uh, the, the bill stated that if a fee was charged, the public agency uh, would have the opportunity then to go straight to the Coastal Commission to obtain the CDP and the city at that point uh, doesn't have jurisdiction anymore. The City Council's direction on this matter, like I mentioned earlier, was to bring back a resolution to memorialize it, uh, but at this time, uh, staff was told to comply with the state bill and err on the side of caution, uh, city attorney. And the only thing I would add, director, is that nothing in that state legislation indicates an iota of retroactivity. So any fees that have already been left charged or um, accumulated in no way is, was that a clawback to say those are wiped off the books or the city must return that check. Um, and if they don't, they of course lose the ability to process. Thank you, director. Thank you, and since this year, uh, the beginning of this year, no further fees have been assessed on this project by the city. If I may have the next slide, please. MRCA requested that uh, there be a change on number 16 regarding um, the signage and uh, the relate, how it relates to the beach management plan. Once again, at this time, uh, staff doesn't see that there is a reason to modify this particular condition. Correct. Um, you know, nothing in the conditions of approval would supersede the, the provision of the LCP 
cited or requested by MRCA indicating that it is always applicable if it's in the conditions of approval. If not, I get it for, you know, clarity's sake, but, you know, we definitely do not want to go down that. And particularly, too, in sense that if the LCP changes, now we potentially have a conflicting condition of approval with the LCP. Next slide, please. There was a updated sign that apparently there was an inaccurate sign in the exhibit. There's been an updated sign provided to the city at the end of my presentation. I will present that slide to you. I received it this morning from uh, the uh, Mihoa attorneys. And so we'll have that as, as MRCA commented, an updated map will be provided and it was. And so we'll be showing that to you at the end of this for the record. Next slide, please. The, this pro proper, uh, I think we just lost our, there we go. This particular project condition is a standard catch-all uh, condition that the city puts on any project on the beach. Uh, MRCA states that this project does not apply to the project, this condition does not apply to the project. MRCA, the applicant, owns this beach, which the,
check, check. Yep. All right, we're going to resume the meeting, and we apologize for the uh, technical difficulty with that, but we're going to continue with uh, Director Mullica's presentation. As I was discussing, MRCA's concern with this condition was that they feel it does not apply to the project, as MRCA owns the beach property over which the improvements are being made. This is a standard condition that staff puts on beachfront type projects uh, because oftentimes the applicant may need to uh, access the beach through an access way owned by the state or beaches and harbors uh, and drive equipment across the sand onto where they're doing work. So once again, if the commission wishes to remove this, pro this particular condition, it would not have a bearing on the project unless, of course, they need to access the beach from some other point. So once again, this is just the standard uh, kind of catch-all type condition. Next slide, please. Once again, this is another catch-all type condition. MRCA requested that the city identify the necessary permits as required by outside agencies. Uh, so that MRCA can agree to this condition. Once again, we do this that in case anything changes during the construction phase or in time with regulations, uh, there is the requirement that the owner understands that they're required to obtain any permits from uh, Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, once again, if it's the commission's wish, uh, they could the commission could add to this if applicable the applicant shall obtain next slide please with this staff recommends that the planning commission uh, determine that the project is consistent with the initial study and negative declaration that was prepared and approve the project as conditioned if i may have my last slide this is the sign acceptance uh, that we were discussed earlier on in the conditions there would be an updated version this was a version staff received today from uh, the mihoa representatives that was accepted as part of the beach management plan and settlement agreement signage plan staff is available for questions i believe that the applicant mrca is available uh, via zoom as well for any questions this evening thank you all right, we're going to start commissioners with disclosures. John? Oh, I, I have uh, visited the gates in the past, and uh, I was in, in the hearings on the houses on 
West Sea level that are conditioned differently than this project. Okay. Dennis? I met with Mr. Doug Cohen, a uh, neighbor across the street on, uh, from the Lechuza uh, entrance. Um, we walked down to the beach. I looked at what was all down there, but uh, other than that, nothing. Jeff? Um, well, about years ago, I served on the uh, advisory commission for the, for, uh, the applicant. Um, I, but I have a question. I, I, to, today, I read a fairly strongly worded letter from MRCA uh, responding to a letter from the Resnick Trust. And uh, try as I might, I couldn't find the letter from the Resnick Trust. Did that letter get distributed? If it did, I might have missed it. But I think we're going to get that letter up if we haven't received it. I have not read that piece of correspondence. Somebody else was processing correspondence for me today. Give us one second, Chair. Um, for what okay. it's worth, yes, staff did receive that letter. I, re I did receive that letter. Of course, I know that <coughs> is are not nearly as important as you all getting it, so hang tight. Okay. Uh, Craig, do you want to continue with disclosures? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll vamp for a few bars here. Um, no, I have a lot. Um, We're just doing disclosures. Disclosures, exactly. Um, yeah, we've heard projects on both east and west sea level um, within the past months or year, I should say, maybe. Um, I visited the site in June, spent over three hours there. I took about 50 photographs for my own recollection, which I did give to staff. Um, so there are photos. If there are any particular spots that somebody wants to talk about details, we might have a photo of that. Um, while I was there, I spoke with a dozen individuals, um, all visitors on the beach. I described the project to them with as much scientific detachment as I could muster. Everyone's reaction was that they thought that no further development would be desirable or appropriate beyond some basic repairs to stairs and you know rehabbing some things. Several said things along the lines of that they come here to get away from civilization and wouldn't want it taking over here too. Um, so the, the project got nothing but pushback from the visitors who were there. Um, I also saw a 10 or 12 inch diameter corrugated ABS drain pipe opening near the bottom of the stairs in area three that was disgorging a flood of gray water. It looked sudsy like somebody washing a car, more, more than a washing machine. Um, but I was talking to some other people at the time. I didn't follow up on that. But in retrospect, I wonder how that is accounted for in the plan as it runs directly between the proposed toilet block and the leach field and may interact with lot 141. Um, last week, I spoke with Ken Ehrlich. He called. Uh, we talked about his client's interests about um, the, the gates and the access. Um, I guess we will talk about that as we go here. Um, I got a call from a resident who lives on the other side of Broad Beach Road um, who's said he's opposed to adding the gate. It's contrary to the access um, and, and in, in any case concerned about the locking gate for in terms of emergencies or if, if there's a fire, they need to get down to the beach. Um, and so, but, but he's not among the people who automatically would get access and yet he lives right there. Um, his opinion on the, uh, the, the stairs was that they should rebuild the existing upper course fix or rehab, but keep the long lower midsection and rebuild the section down at the beach. And then I heard from one guy in the neighborhood who said that hanging a bathroom on a cliff right next to the ocean makes about as much sense as a screen door on a submarine. Uh, from the rest of the conversation, I'm not sure if he was thinking it would slide off the cliff or be washed away or if it was redundant because you could just pee in the ocean or maybe all of the above. Um, so. Just so you know, I have a lot of general questions and then some that are more specific to the individual areas. That, uh, so however you want to run things, um, that's, those are my disclosures. Thanks. Okay. Um, I received... Um, oh, Chair, if I may, I just want to get to Commissioner Jennings. Go ahead. Question. So yes, it was distributed at 951, 52 this morning. Um, and I do believe that the gentleman who wrote the letter is also in the Zoom. So I, I assume that if he wants to speak and explain his, his or her position. 
Go ahead, Chair. Okay, um, I too have visited uh, the site multiple times over the years. I have done work for various properties on sea level and others over the years, none of whom any of the people I've ever worked for commented or contacted me about this project and none of that was all repair work and wouldn't have any effect on my decision in regards to this. Although one thing I should note is one time I was working at a job on the beach down there and a lady fell on those stairs and got a little bit hurt. Um, we went and actually assisted her. She had trouble getting up because she merely slipped and fell. The bottom of those stairs gets covered with a lot of sand and they're very slippery. So I would have just hope and I would imagine that if MRCA is addressing this, um, they would use something that has good traction on it for those stairs. Uh, that is my comment. So we are now going to hear from the applicant. And I believe the applicant is calling in virtually. And we have any public for here? We do have public for here, but we have to listen to the applicant first. Um, go ahead. Elena Eager. Hi, Commissioners, um, Chair Peak. Good evening. Elena Eager, can you hear me? We can hear you just fine. Okay. Uh, Elena Eager representing the Mountains Recreation and Conservation Authority. And we don't have anything more to add to um, your staff's report for approval um, beyond the fact that we would like to use the rest of our time for rebuttal if necessary. Okay, we'll set that up for you. Um, all right, we're now going to go to public comment in the room and Joe Drummond. First, I'd just like to say I didn't appreciate being called a liar because I put myself on the line and my name out there for everything I say and do, so please don't do that. I, I have been attacked and um, put on as a pariah for uncovering codes not being followed, so I just want to put that out there that I understand why someone wouldn't want to show their tell them who they are with this whole mess. But anyway, with regards to this project, I've had some dealings with Elena Eng Engar with our own, with MRCA land in Big Rock and PCH where they don't take care of anything. They just, they've refused to take care of the property and it's supposed to be a view, view corridor. So I don't believe anything that the MRCA says when it comes to taking care of the property. I know this is a very small beach, so I don't know what kind of access or bathrooms. There should not be any bathrooms made on a beach. Like that's any new bathrooms, new, it just, it's not right. But I don't know anything about this, the existing stairway there. If it's dangerous, it needs to be fixed. But um, I don't believe in building any higher retaining walls or just any any environmental damage to the cliffs or anything like that, obviously. So that's all I have to say. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Kathleen. And Kathleen, you're followed by Robert Marin. Um, I had a speech, but I also just received um, a copy of the correspondence from Elena to Mr. Malika from just before six o'clock. So I want to address that again, I keep thinking I'm mistaken, but when the emphasis now says at the end of the letter that at any time, the plan is based, the, the, the improvement plan is also based on this agreement, the settlement agreement, and it's my understanding from the Mahoa uh, lawyers that that means that we are limited beyond our deeded private property rights, which are incredibly valuable to us, meaningful. I live 45 feet from that entrance and I own a deeded right over it. And when you get a property, it doesn't take away your deeded rights. So I am still confused by her correspondence. If they are changing it, if Elena is now saying that they are going to honor our deeded rights, that we have access at all times, at our choice, not restricted, not emergency use only, and that's what she's writing, then I welcome that. 
um, because that certainly would make a big difference for my husband and myself. But I've, I have asked and asked and I have gotten no answers or answers saying I know something that I don't know because I've had to repeatedly ask my homeowners association for these documents and not get them or get two at once and they're conflicting and you ask for what clarification, which is the accurate one, you know, oh, I'm too busy, I'll get to you in a week or two. Um, that would have bypassed the last time you were all meeting about this, but it got pushed. So we're not trying to be difficult, we're just trying to honor our private rights. And when our homeowners association says may, it's also a concern because they've used may historically as no, as, and serious restrictions of no. At one time when I first moved there, um, 23 years ago, we were actually told that we couldn't come down to sea level drive because we didn't live on it, even though we are equal paying members of the homeowner association and our deeds all say the same thing. This is why it's so important to us that this be clear. So all we're asking is if, if you're going to honor our deeded rights, which is that we don't have restricted access, then we, and, and it's not may, but will, then that is the issue that we've been writing about. And if that's what she's now saying, great, could we just clarify that? And I'm sorry, I'm gonna read you my letter, which before I got this, but, so my, um, I've lived in Malibu for 43 years. I'm not well known to you because I'm not a problem in my community. I met my husband on Old Malibu Road. I'm asking you, the members of the City Planning Commission, to maintain the current scope and breadth of our access. It's our deeded rights. We have, is that the end of me? That's the end of you. Thank you. Okay, I was gonna give you another 15 seconds if you wanna wrap it up. Um, yeah, it's, it's just that this is 45 feet from our house and this community is designed for a community and our access ways, otherwise, I either go 10 seconds to go to my access to the, to the beach, to my other property on EC Level Drive, which I own, or I have to walk uh, over a half a mile. And currently I have a broken back and a concussion. I'm getting older. I don't want to have to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. Um, Robert? And Robert, you are followed by Mr. Ehrlich. I'm really just uh, here to ask a question about area four, which is the East Sea uh, Level Drive access. Uh, my understanding from the information is that that gate and pedestrian entrance is not going to change. So I want clarification on that. And um, uh, my wife and I have a house at, uh, at 31544 Broad Beach, which is the corner of sea level and Broad Beach, and uh, the gate and the pedestrian uh, access to the, in the in the gate are, are, have a lot of deferred maintenance, which you may or not be aware of. And um, I don't know whether if this uh, project m moves forward, whether or not trucks will be going through the East Sea Level Drive entrance and snaking their way down to the beach, which seems to me like it's an accident waiting to happen, or whether or not they're gonna go through with it if the project moves forward the West Sea Level Drive access. We're gonna answer that in a little bit. But you still have, are you done? That's all, okay. that's all I have. Thank you, Robert. I think it's one more in. There you go, perfect, thank you. Good evening, Mr. Chair, Commissioners. Um, 
Planning Director Mollica. My name is Ken Ehrlich. I represent Kathleen Summers. And just to orient you all, looking at the slide, um, Ms. Summers and her husband live two doors to the right of the, uh, the corner of uh, Broad Beach Road in Area 3. So it's called Lot I. The areas, the access is called Lot I. So that it puts into context what my client was talking about, how easy access is from her house currently down to the beach. Further putting into context what this is all about, homeowners who live in this area within this homeowners association have within their deeds access to the beach. Our clients is through lot I, through west sea level up in uh, area one, and east sea level in area four. So that, that's, what, that's, what the, that's what Kathleen was talking about when she said it's intended to be a community. So those who live on the beach have, or, or coastal homeowners, and those who don't live on the beach have easy access down to the beach. The series of agreements that you all are encapsulating into a CDP tonight have provisions regarding and that affect the deeded access rights that our clients have and similarly situated homeowners up there have. For example, Section 2.4 of the Beach Management Plan talks about re, um, MRCA taking ownership to the lot I gate and giving keys or access to that gate to Mahoa, and then Mahoa may give keys or access to its members. Moving down to Section 4.0 of the Beach Management Plan, it imposes access hours on lot I and says that after those access hours, the homeowners will have emergency access only, which is, goes against what they have now in their deeded access rights, which are unrestricted. Further, we asked six months ago to try to avoid this problem. We, we reached out to both Maho and MRCA, explaining that we have unrestricted deeded access, and that, and, and what we got back from Mahoa's council was, you don't really understand how complicated these negotiations were, so you don't need anything. Well, my client happened to be president of Mahoa for a number of years and knows exactly, and, and this was all going on then too. We know exactly what was going on. We just asked for a simple side letter explaining that they're not going to have the discretion and that they'll simply give us the access codes. We've received nothing. We asked the same thing from MRCA, and what MRCA did was they responded to Mr. Malika explaining to Mr. Malika that we're wrong because we'll have access when we need to during emergencies through Lot I. But that's not what we have now. So we're, we're simply asking to make this fair for the deeded access owners, if I could just finish my sentence, to simply have what they have now. So we're asking for a condition from this commission to say what the deeded access rights owners have now, they would have those same rights in the future. Thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ken. Norm? Thank you again, uh, commissioners, for uh, the opportunity to speak to this issue. Uh, I'm more than just a little familiar with this beach, and um, I want to address uh, several issues. Um, first of all, it was an excellent presentation uh, by staff. I, I definitely appreciate that. Um, the CCC, the California Coastal Commission, has two primary goals. One is to protect coastal resources. The other is to provide access to those resources when the access does not have a negative impact uh, on the quality of the resources. And I, I think that the MRCA is going to be able to do that. Um, for 20 years, at least, the city of Malibu has been extremely critical of the MRCA for not managing and taking care of the properties that they own. And to a great extent, those criticisms uh, were justified. But not in this case. In this case, they're doing exactly what they ought to do. Basically, every public beach should have a restroom facility, whether it's a, a porta potty or some other situation where people on the beach can relieve themselves 
without having to travel miles. And this particular beach, if a family goes down there and they have two little kids and they have to go to the bathroom, whatever version of that is, the father has to go up the stairs, and by the way, these stairs are dangerous, and the treads and the risers need to be replaced. If they're not replaced, they should close it completely. Moving on, they go up and they get their car, and this is on, on a Sunday or a Saturday during the summer, and they drive to Trancas to hunt for a restroom. And of course, they're the, at, at the uh, gas station, it's always closed because they don't want the public to use it. So they go to Starbucks and they buy a cup of coffee and the kids get to go to the restroom. By the time they get back, their space is taken. Now they have to park, park a mile down the street, hike up to get to where they were before. This, this is not appropriate. None of the public beaches run by the state of California uh, don't have bathroom facilities. And this particular bathroom facility is not hanging off a cliff. It's on caissons, just like 90% of the homes on the beach. Is that it? Wow. Norm, thank you. Can I, can I get uh, one more second? You can. Okay. Um, I, I do think that if the homeowners have access over I at any time, that lot I, that the one that I said was dangerous, that should probably be upheld. Thank you very much. Thank you, Norm. I've never worked for the MRCA. <laughs> Thank you oh, again, Norm. One last thing. The leach field <laughs> is not on the beach. The leach field is behind a seawall, and the homeowners gave them permission to have it there. Thank you. Understood. Do we have any other public comments online? Um, there are six raised hands versus Sina Samimi. Hello, commissioners. Uh, b before you start my time, I, did I hear Commissioner Jennings correctly that there was a response letter to the Resnick Trust letter that was submitted? Because if that's the case, I have not received it. I'm the author of the Resnick Trust letter. And it also sounds like the commissioners have not received my letter, even though I was assured uh, at 8.59 this morning that in past tense, it has been shared with the commissioners. So I think there's a couple of disconnects here that I want to clarify before I get started. Uh, okay, so we, we did receive the letter. I believe that the response letter was directed to the city, and it sounds like it wasn't directed to you, and that may be why you did not receive it. Um, that, I guess, would fall in the air of the MRCA, who did not respond to you and responded to the city. So you can request that letter. I know that that letter will be in the public record. And if staff has your email, maybe they could forward that letter right I, now so that you can have actually, it. I actually, thank you, thank you, uh, uh, Chair Peek. I emailed uh, Planning Commissioner, uh, sorry, I, I emailed uh, Richard Mollica and Adrian Fernandez at, right after uh, Commissioner Jennings stated that, asking for them to send me a copy of that. So if that's okay, I'd like to just to get called later on in the okay. hearing. Okay, so we're going to we're going to call you at the end of of this. That's fine. I understand. Thank you. So we're going to go to the next online speaker. And sorry for the uh, confusion on that. Alan Abshez. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission. My name is Alan Apshes. I'm here on behalf of the Malibu and Small Homeowners Association. We're here to re respectfully request your approval of the CDP for the uh, Lechuza Beach Access Improvement Project. The project will improve access to Lechuza Beach while protecting the surrounding Nahoa residential community through its installation of pedestrian gates that will be locked during nighttime hours and its implementation of a beach management plan <clears throat> and other contractual agreements between Mahoa and the MRCA. As you know, this has a very long history. In October 2000, the Coastal Conservancy funded the purchase of the undeveloped beach lots in the Mahoa community for public recreation. 
the conservancy required that MRCA work with MOHOA to produce a mutually acceptable long-term public access management agreement for the MRCA lots. Since that time, nearly 23 years ago, the MRCA and MOHOA, with the assistance of the city, Coastal Conservancy, the Coastal Commission, we've all worked collaboratively to arrive at a mutually acceptable plan and resolve differences regarding the MRCA access easements over West and East Sable Level Drive and agree on a long-term beach management plan. Approval of the CDP is desired by the MOHOA community and it will effectuate the, the settle, their settlement agreement with the MRCA. The West and East Sable Level Gates, which have long protected MOHOA's private streets and the MOHOA community, and whose installation predates the adoption of the Coastal Act will be officially recognized. Public access to the project's ADA parking and loading spaces are going to be provided in mutually agreeable locations along West and East Level Drive, as will daytime pedestrian access over West and sea, East Sea Level Drive. The Lodi pedestrian gate and the gates of West Sea Level uh, viewing platform will also be reinstalled and locked during nighttime hours. All of Mahoa's members will receive keys and as Ms. Uh, Ms. Ager's October 2nd letter to you, uh, of, I see is that dated today, as her letter states, they will have access at all times. <clears throat> Pursuant to the beach management plan, the MRCA will conduct regular inspection of its property and facilities. When daily, they'll clean the restroom, remove trash, and remove trash cans uh, from, that they maintain at, in the Mahoa community. The beach management plan also requires that they conduct a foot patrol of the MRCA lot and inspect signs, locks, gates, and viewing platforms and parking spaces to ensure they're good, in good condition and repair. In summary, this is the kind of agreement that I, I agree with Mr. Haney that will ensure that the MRCA acts responsibly in the maintenance of its assets and it acts in a manner that's consistent with the community. With that, we request that you approve the CDP as recommended by staff, and I'm here to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Bill Sampson. Good evening. I live just up the street at what ought to be called the Cottontail Lane um, gate, but it's called the Bunny Lane. That's area three. Uh, many years ago, uh, that's where a uh, Skyler, I am not a liar, by the way. Um, I live on Cottontail Lane. There are three motels up there. Uh, people there use this access way. Those are the motels you promised me and Rosemary Schuyler you would not approve. Moving along, the stairways there, to give you an idea of how likely Merck is to actually honor its agreement to commit to um, maintain stuff. Years ago, I wrote them about the steps at the top. They get covered with sand. They don't come close to complying to any building code I've ever heard of. The treads slant down. Two weeks ago, my best buddy, a mountaineer, he has climbed all the volcanoes in the Northwest. He's climbed the hardest of the uh, 50 state high points, Granite Peak in Wyoming. He fell on those steps. Merca was warned about them probably a decade ago by me. They did nothing. Many years ago, I attended a meeting with where Merca Ranger was. He said, oh, the problem is the other side of the tracks. It didn't take long to figure out he was talking about my street. Maybe we are on Cottontail, the other side of the tracks. There is no reason to believe that Merca will clean up anything. They make a mess. Nobody ever does anything about it. Mahoa's, and I'm not a member of Mahoa, we have nothing to do with it. I'm just a member of the public living over there. Nevertheless, because of Merca, trash, diapers, used condoms, broken bottles, every conceivable item is left by Mr. Edmiston's invited guests. He does nothing whatsoever to pick up after them, but he makes sure they get there, tells them all about it. Finally, look at the that's the story poles. You're building a restroom on the beach. How have those worked out for you? You like how they look? You know how they're going to look. You know how they're going to smell. These people don't take care of stuff. There is no way you can put enough teeth into your approvals. And perhaps um, 
Well, Mr. Jennings, your disdain for those of us who supported Schuyler, maybe you were right after all, but I don't happen to agree. Two of those guys changed their tune. As for the beach itself, we quit going down there because it is such a mess all the time. Norm tried to sell me lot I a couple of years ago for 5,000 bucks. He then said, oh, you can have a 99 year lease. And then he refused to supply any kind of a title. Let me get any title insurance. So I'm pretty familiar with the area. Don't let these guys. Thank you, Bill. Them. Patrick Crowley. Hi. Um, yeah, I've lived uh, right next to Lot I for 23 years, and in the last 15 years since the MRCA has been involved, I have to agree with Mr. Sampson. It is the worst maintained beach in anywhere. I worked in. I grew up in Laguna Beach. I used to work on the beach cleanup crew for three years. Every summer we go down and clean the beaches. No one ever cleans the beach at La Chusa. If, if you come off the street, there's a huge trench, which they haven't filled in, that people have just worn by going up and down the uh, through this dirt path that leads down to these dangerous, dangerous stairs. MRCA does nothing. The ranger goes, parks his truck in the middle of the street, leaves the blinkers on, doesn't get out of the truck, doesn't do anything, phones in, then goes and leaves. So rather than just criticizing the MRCA though, would it not be possible to have some kind of a, a plan in place that if the MRCA does not maintain the beach, if the toilets do not work, if the toilets, if the leach fields are not functioning properly and contaminating the beach and the flow going out and killing the kelp and killing the sea lions and doing the stuff that we all don't want to have happen, that we could take that back from the MRCA, that we could force them to take the toilets away? Is there not some mechanism by which the city can say, you're not doing what you said you would do in your contract? You're not doing, you're not following through at all. MRCA is an easy target because they are evil. But is there not some way to be able to police them, to be able to make them live up to their word. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Sina Samimi. Uh, again, before you start my time, I'm still reviewing the letter. I apologize. Uh, is it possible to take a five minute recess and maybe that'll also give time for the commissioners who have not read the Resnick Trust letter to read it? Uh, and then we, Un we unfortunately, be... unfortunately, we're not able to do that. So you're going to have to proceed at this time. We, we've all read the, read the documentation. Okay. All right. Let's proceed. Um, uh, I have a I have a uh, slideshow presentation. So I'll wait for that to come up. Your presentation is visible. Okay, thank you very much. Next slide, please. This map shows uh, Lot 41, which is owned by the Resnick Trust. Um, there is a statement in the staff report, I'll quote it, it's on page nine. The lower portions of the project area are owned by MRCA up to East Sea Level Drive, which is owned by Mihoa with an access easement for MRCA. The statement's obviously incorrect, Lot 141, is there and it's not owned by MRCA. And uh, it, the next slide, please. If you go to the, the this is just one of many uh, misleading maps that are in uh, the negative declaration and elsewhere in, in the record. If you have to have a magnifying glass and you'd need a reason to double check the map just to understand that lot 41 is not owned by MRCA there. Anyone looking at that map any member of the public is gonna look at that and see MRCA fee title. Uh, that is incorrect. Uh, in 2008, uh, the Resnick uh, Trust highlighted the same issue in response to that letter. I'm gonna quote in its exhibit one. You can go to the next slide, please. Regarding Mr. Resnick's concern that the proposed proposal blocks access, the MRCA will submit a uh, revised proposal for East Sea Level Drive 
to position parking spaces so that access is not impeded. Uh, I, I didn't get a chance to fully review the letter response from MRCA, but it looks like they're saying, oh, well, we're not putting uh, ADA parking spaces there anymore. So we're, we're, we didn't lie. Okay, you didn't put parking spaces there. You put something way more robust, way more imposing, and something that blocks access way more than just a parking space. You're, you're now looking to construct a restroom, leach fields, OWTS, a viewing deck. So, yes, you're right, you're not putting the ADA parking spot there now, but you're impeding access way worse than what you did originally in 2008. And so, actually, I wanted to apologize on behalf of my client for the late submission of our letter. It's because in 2008, the MRCA had promised that it was not going to block access when it reproposed its project. And so, Mr. Resnick and, and the Resnick trucks, they were in support of this project. They want to improve the access. They're in support of all elements of the project except for the ones that are blocking access to his property. So uh, it also looks like there's something in the letter saying there's no such a thing as the westerly extension of East Sea Level Drive. That is a quote directly from the beach management plan that's used several times. So we didn't make that up. That's a quote from the beach level ma uh, management plan. Next slide, please. This is just a close up showing where lot 41 is and where you can see the mid level of sea level drive. And so obviously the, the bathrooms there on the left, the viewing decks there on the right, uh, the lowest portion of the stairs are there. You're not going to be able to construct a road there to give access to lot 41 if these are made. Now, you might be thinking, why is this relevant to the planning commission? I'm here uh, to look at the project. Well, it's relevant because you're not going to be able to make the findings. Finding eight for the variances say the subject site is physically suitable for the proposed variance. Well, it's not because it's blocking access to a private property owner that's right there. So uh, there's other reasons. Some of the commenters have touched on it already, but uh, I'm just going to qu quickly go to the reduced okay, project. Okay, so, so your time is up. I'm going to allow you to speak for a little bit longer, but you need to kind of wrap it up in the next 30 seconds. All right, I think I'm unmuted again. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, so I, I'll open myself up to questions uh, if, if the commissioners have questions of me. Uh, I obviously haven't had a chance to look at the, the response letter yet, but, but I'm available for questions. Uh, please review the letter. Everything that I'm going to say is already in there. Uh, so uh, that's pretty much all I have to say now. Thank you. Okay, do we have no more? The only raised hand is from the applicant team. So yeah. they have rebuttal. Okay, yeah. so let's go ahead and proceed with that. Tracy Iovrick. And Tracy, you have 14 minutes and 37 seconds remaining for rebuttal. Okay, I will just uh, take um, a brief second to address the comment uh, regarding the water intrusion onto the beach um, by Commissioner Hill. Um, we have previously addressed a water issue emanating from 31725 Sea Level Drive um, in our letter back in August 18th, 2022. Um, water appears to come from the side of their house, run down a gutter into the drain and was um, appearing on top of the lower steps that went down to the beach, um, causing some water to go across that small landing there. Um, we sent that letter and asked for the water to be taken care of. Um, it appears that it has been redirected and it is now exiting onto the beach and we will be following up on that issue. Thank you. Is that it? Elena uh, Egger also raised her hand. Okay. Elena, are you there? I am. Okay, you got 13 <laughs> minutes and 40 seconds. Clarification, Elena Ager, MRCA. Um, I'm glad that uh, you heard from uh, Mahoa itself about the settlement agreement that should address Kathleen Summers and Mr. Ehrlich's, her attorney's um, concerned, concern regarding uh, the homeowner's uh, ability to access lot I after hours. Um, so I will reserve most of my time to talk about the letter that we sent to your planning director, Mr. Malika, um, regarding the Resnick Trust and Council's letter to you. The letter was not addressed to MRCA. 
hence the response back to the city when it was provided to us today early. Our, our response came in in a timely manner during the business day, and I have no idea why it was not given to the resident trust and their council. So I will say this to what um, the resident trust council has to say about um, showing that lot 141 is somehow misleading on the map. It is not, it's gray, outlined in gray on the, on the southern side, the beach side, just like the other lines that indicate private property within the tract. It's surrounded, that is lot 141, is surrounded by public property, hence the other boundaries are in green, denoting public property. I don't think I need a magnifying glass to see that. The parking spaces that um, the Resnick Trust says are were revoked somehow, our um, MRC's agreement, those parking spaces are not located in the hatched area that um, council put up on the screen for you. The restroom is not in the hatched area either. Um, but with that said, the MRCA agreed in 2008 not to put the parking spaces in that area and they're not there. The restroom is to the west of the hatched area. The parking space, ADA accessible parking space lies to the east of the hatched area. So, I think those are the issues that the Resnick Trust brought up, um, but I will conclude by saying that Lot A, as everyone knows, the terminus of East Sea Level, which is also referred to as Lot A, is a sandy beach. It is not a paved street. It was a paper street, as we call them in the planning profession, but it is not paved. And the access that the residents enjoy is the, is the same as access that anyone else enjoys to the beach and to their lot, respectively. So with that, we are happy to answer any of the planning commissioners questions, but those are the rebuttals um, I have on my list and happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you very much. Um, the public comment for this hearing is now closed unless we, of course, call somebody up to ask some kind of questions or anything like that. Um, we're now up here. Who would like to start us off? Jeff. I have a question. This relates to the discussion on page 37 of 42, conditional use permit. The NMC states no on-site wastewater treatment system or part thereof shall be located on any other property other than the property where the building or structure served by such OWTS is located. Uh, this was commonly called the Norm Haney Exclusion Act when it was adopted. Uh, Norm, who owned the property um, uh, or one of his entities owned properties on West Sea Level Drive. This is the way I remember it. It's been like 30 years ago. But he owned these properties and he wanted to develop them. And he wanted to put the wastewater treatment systems underneath the road, which was a better location for it. And there was a concerted effort to avoid allowing those lots to be developed. And that was the reason why the uh, prohibition was enacted. Um, I don't remember all of the players that participated in that, but I seem to remember that MRCA uh, was participant, um, which when I read this, I was, you know, the irony of seeing them hoist by their own petard was uh, attractive. But, but on a larger question is the one that I have. How do you ignore or how do you get around a flat prohibition by simply saying, oh, well, we'll give you a, a conditional use permit. For example, we have provisions in our code that say that you cannot have a secondary use on a piece of property unless you've got a primary use. This has always bothered me because if, for example, you had a piece of property and you 
wanted and your neighbor had a vacant piece of property and you wanted to have horses and you wanted to have a, a barn and corrals built on the adjacent piece of property, you couldn't because uh, that's a secondary use. You have to have a primary use. You have to have to put the house up first. Uh, and and so is it now the position of the city of the uh, uh, planning staff, whoever you people are, the planning staff that. Uh, any of these prohibitions can be waived simply by applying for a, a conditional use permit? And if so, what are the standards by which the, the appropriateness of a conditional use permit are to be judged? I'm not sure if Richard was going to answer that question, but um, I think the section you are reading is a quote from the code. And so... Um, in uh, this particular case, the code was amended so that uh, when they have a septic system that is encompassed on a property other than where the development is proposed, they um, are allowed to uh, proceed with a conditional use permit. Okay. Um, it would have been nice to put that provision in the staff report. I'm just reading what the fourth. Uh, all I did was quote the staff report, which doesn't include that provision. So is that a provision that applies only to uh, this particular, the Norm Haney Exclusion Act? Is that, is that the only one it applies to? That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Do we have a citation or can you quote it? It is it is quoted in there, and there's a, a code requirement. Uh, so it says uh, municipal code section 15.40.070, and then it gives you the quotes from that section. What I'm reading there, reading the quote, it doesn't seem to like Commissioner Jennings is saying. It doesn't really say whether you you could go against that with a CUP. The next part after it says that, it says, thus the proposed project requires a CUP to locate the leach field on a separate property. That's what staff is saying. That's not the quote of the code. I, I apologize. I, I thought it did. But it's, um, yes, um, If I think if we go back and read this section uh, in the code, uh, there would be a statement in there that allows this type of request to be processed with a conditional use permit. No. I, I, Can you, can you find that in the in there, please? Adrian? I'll look for it. Thank you. Well, be that as it may, let me let me make the larger comment that um, this area has been a hotbed of litigation uh, for what 20, 25 years now. Um, Norm engaged in litigation before this. It'd be nice if we could put that to rest. Although, see, now this gets back to the whole conflict of interest thing because I'm a lawyer, and so maybe I have a financial interest in making sure that this doesn't settle, um, like Mr. Ehrlich. Um, so, um, but it does seem to me that, that I, I realize that the individual property owners were not parties to the negotiation. It was the Homeowners Association and it was MRCA. But to have this come before us and ha have us try to make a decision with these conflicting statements about whether rights are being preserved or not, not, not ordinarily, traditionally, we do not consider that. We don't consider the easement rights that other people have or the, you know, the anti-development rights that they might have. That's left for them to go to the courts and, and fight out, which, of course, is what they've been doing for the last 20, 25 years. It does seem to me, with counsel as accomplished and distinguished and respected as Mr. Abshus and, and Mr. Ehrlich, that maybe there would be a way to work out some small language that would resolve the issue, something like, you know, nothing in this agreement shall be to the derogation of the property rights or the dated easement rights, and everybody kind of sign off on that. Um, Ordinarily, we traditionally leave these 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 battles to the to the parties. Um, in in a case where it's MRCA on the other side, that's really like throwing somebody the lions. Um, so, I guess what I would like to see is is there isn't some way that we can encourage 
the parties to resolve these conflicting issues with regard to Lot 41, with regard to uh, the easement rights of the parties, and then be before we sign off on this thing. I mean, all to the good. We want to put this to bed. We want to get it resolved. Um, makes makes great sense to have it done, but um, it it does seem to me that maybe with a little bit more effort, uh, we could in, we could resolve we could get a result that would be less productive of future conflict. Okay. I like your wisdom in that. Yeah. Um, go ahead, John. Uh, I was going to put in the resolution. I, I agree 100% with Jeff, and the last time we heard this, we asked staff to come back resolving all these issues before we got to it. And I was going to put in the resolution, not being a lawyer, um, let's see, Emmer's, let's see. Okay, I'll read it, but I agree with no, no, Jeff. Just hold hold yeah. on. I was going to say, so this is I a, requested yeah. some similar language that both of you have requested from Patrick to help to read into this as a condition or somewhere in this if this is approved. And I would like him to shed a little bit of light on that language now. Perfect. So echoing the sentiment of Commissioner Jennings, we, you know, don't really ever put our fingers on the scale one way or the other. And so we want to be, be cognizant of that. So the language that I have is it's going to be impossible for us to articulate every single easement right private right so we're not going to do that because th those can change um, for a variety of reasons so the language that I've teed up is the hours of the public access for the three pedestrian gates apply only for access by the public any private rights of ingress or egress over these lots via easement license or other property right shall not be limited by the stated hours and do not limit or restrict any private rights of access whatsoever the only thing I was going to add to that is nothing in this agreement shall change any private rights that existed before this agreement, what? Uh, which would cover, I assume, more than just the hours. And so, and, and, and there may be quite a few where you're crossing somebody else's property, et cetera. I just would like to lock them all down to whatever rights they had when they bought the property, they still have them. And if we could somehow work that in there, that would be, make me happy. Um, I think that, so before we go to another part of that, mm -hmm. Craig would like to comment on that, John. And then Patrick, sure. I would like you to come back. And yep. I, I think that there's a way to do this. And I think there's a way to do, do that that also says, you know, I actually think that it's the MRCA's intention in their agreement that they don't want to restrict the access. I think that the issues sort of resolve around keys going to a homeowners association and then getting distributed to owners and other things like that. But if we can come up with some language, I think that we're moving in the right direction. Yeah, I would, I, well, I have other threshold questions, but on this point, um, I think we're, we need to take into consideration the, whether it's a prescriptive easement that has developed there already, but that, that gate has been gone for what we've heard at least a decade. And so everybody on Cottontail and Bunny Lane, they need to get through there. They need to get through there for emergency. If there's a fire, they need to get down to the beach. It seems like there should be a way to carve out, and I think using a key code would make more sense than having to pass out actual cards, right? But a way to say everybody within, for example, the, the 500 feet of, of a gate, which is sort of a typical definition of neighborhood or vicinity that we use often. Everyone within 500 feet, and then if, if I haven't done the, the geometry here, but if somebody at the back end of Cottontail is just beyond 500 feet, that they would still be included. So 500 feet plus the, the cul-de-sacs. I, I understand the where you're going with that. I think that we have a very difficult thing. I can't require property owner to give access to a, somebody else that doesn't have already but access that's deeded to that property. The argument is and that, that having not had a gate there for so long that, that, that they, they can't If somebody now. wanted to go and fight that prescriptive easement or something like that, that's on them and we can't make that. I don't think that we can make that no, decision I don't at agree, all. No, I don't agree either. <laughs> Correct. And, and, and the only thing that I would similarly add is that 
we're all aware of, of Ms. Summers' position now, and I, I do not doubt the veracity for a single second, but things can change. Maybe in 20 or 30 years, the current, the property owner says, hey, I, I want to stop, I want to stop this, I don't want this anymore, and they're going to they're gonna go to Ms. Summers or her, or her successor and say, how much does it cost? And so anything that we require that says, in the, in the condition of approval that says, you must allow person X for these hours um, is just tough because then what that results in is that in the future, in 20 or 30 years, you have a CDP with a condition of approval that doesn't match reality anymore. Not not by nefarious deed or not by trying to slink out from underneath it, but just by from private yeah, private agreement. But all we're trying to do is preserve no, I, I, the rights yep, I that, that they have yep. mm -hmm. in their deed. Yep. That's correct. That's simple. I mean, you just can't violate that. And uh, John, I, I think we're pretty much all in agreement on okay. that. Okay, we're going to uh, move to Dennis. Commissioner Jennings, are you suggesting that this should be all worked out first? between the parties in the audience and uh, all those people are involved with that and maybe this would be a continuance and when that is completed we would come back and talk about all this because that is something that as you just stated we wouldn't normally do yeah I was wandering around in that idea but really not I mean, they, these people have litigated forever they all have trod this ground thoroughly um, if I thought there was, you know, this is something that had just popped up, maybe that would be a good idea to send them out there to do that. Um, but I think I'm torn. Might, I'm torn. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm not we might, sure. We, we might even be able to get consensus from the applicant and those that are, you know, present with us now. So that's well, important. What, one, one thing would be to say that, that, that we have a requirement that the, an applicant demonstrate full ownership rights of the project and so we we have some loose edges on those ownership we have this hanging out there and i and i do think there's probably a good case for the prescriptive easement we also have some questions about uh, any ownership rights there's it seems like there's some gray area with respect to the resnick property lot 141 that um you know do they have what what is their easement do they have an easement does mrca have control over that or not, or what is the, I mean, I, I have a lot of questions about that little piece, but. Uh, I, I agree that uh, I would feel a lot happier if, if we could have the lot 141 issue more fully freshed out. I mean, I, I, I never got to see, personally didn't get to see the Resnick letter, although I might have, I'm sure it was delivered to me, I just missed it. Uh, and, but it's tough without having the MRCA's response, which was very detailed and went into a lot of, you know, paragraph by paragraph. Uh, it, it would certainly be help, more helpful, I think, if we could have a better view of, of that particular dispute. Okay, John? Uh, when we sent this back before, I specifically asked, and I believe several other commissioners, that it come back with all these little wrinkles, because we got all these, these letters saying, you're blocking me, you're blocking me. There, there were four or five of them. Uh, there's not quite as many this time, but... We, we shouldn't be sitting here doing this on the fly. This should be worked out. It's very simple. I, I don't think it's legal to take away somebody's rights that's on their deed. They have title insurance that say they have those rights. Do they sue their title company? Do they sue us? Do they sue? Who do they sue? Okay? Uh, it's that kind of thing that we shouldn't be involved in. Uh, I think there's other questions that need to be answered here, too, that haven't even been brought up that should come back with an answer. Uh, so, I understand that. Do you guys want to go into the other elements of this right now, or do you merely want to say, let's work this stuff out and have it come back? Because I think there's other things that we can discuss right now and work through a little bit. And, and they can come back with it, with that too. I mean, we don't, we're not going to solve half of this problem. We just want to get all the things on the table. Yeah, I don't I mean, think I there's think anybody here who wants to stop this. They just want it done right because it's been, as Jeff said, 25. And in my remembrance, it was the day after we became a city, the lawsuit started flying. But uh, uh, whatever. There, there are also just some threshold things that we could have clarified if, if there's a continuance to also get those on board. Like, for example, right now the fire department re review sheet is entirely blank. No signature, no date, no check mark, no nothing. Um, there's some other things like that. You know, there was a public works request from 2019 for a traffic pedestrian vehicle collision study with some detail about 
what has happened, what could happen on Broad Beach Road. That's not in there right now. And there's some other things like that that we could uh, identify for. I will just put like kind of the blanket statement that I think that there is, and I think that everybody here is very well aware that there are major challenges to building on the beach. And what I would not really not like to see here is what happened with a county owned bathroom on the beach up to the west of the public beach at Nicholas Canyon, where they have a bathroom that they built and a part of a road that accesses a bathroom that was damaged by the ocean and remained there. Might even, I'm sure parts of that structure are still there today and not removed where the building fell down onto the beach. Um, was not made, was not built very much higher than the beach, but that stuff was really never removed. And I think that if this is to be approved, there ought to be some sort of conditions in there. If this is waste system and bathroom is gravely damaged um, by the ocean, which I think when we mess with mother nature, we never seem to get it right, but that's beside the point, um, that that stuff should be removed because I don't think that any of the property owners living in that area are ever going to want to deal with one, a damaged wastewater system, very close, mind you, to some of these homes um, or a bathroom that's half crippled onto the sand um, and that there should be some kind of language in there to make sure that that gets removed in a timely manner should that happen. But because I, the sea I level is rising. Up because I've got specifics in front of so but I'm confused. You're, you're now you're talking into the, the merits and the whole yes. plans. I thought the question was still sort of, do we need to continue it now or not? Well, I, I think we've come to that conclusion. What I want to do is add what other questions we want answered. So when we come back here, we have specific answers. And there's some that are haven't even been mentioned here tonight that are very serious. I mean, very serious. Okay, well. uh, Let's start writing then, and let's okay, make a note well, of those. Okay, well, like I'd like to mention, first, we have given a permit to build on West Sea Level. That permit requires the road, requires the road to be widened. We, we are told in the staff report that that CDP is expired, okay? So we have a situation where we have up to five houses being built that can't be built if we approve them, cannot be built. Yet the public is using the property. And there, there were reasons, the reasons we did that was safety issues. So we now have being asked to approve something with a narrower road than we've already decided was safe. Okay, so that's, as far as I'm concerned, they asked, they were, the two were tied together. I think it was this one that CDP that uh, expired two years ago or something. It said, you can't build this stuff without that road being approved. It was, CDP was approved, and then somebody let it expire. They must be tied together, or a reason why not, because we are conflicting with being able to build houses on that road, okay? Especially so you want when some clarification a, in regards to that. I want. I would want a reason why they are not tied together because it affects other planning to projects. Okay, it's they're, they're, those are already that one's already passed. You, um, Adrian or Richard, do you need any more on that? I think that's clear, but I think we might be able to answer the question as to the why. Um, the the reason why the other houses require the road widening is because of the fire department required. In this case, um, they're proposing uh, additional access to the beach, and the project does not require the widening of the road, uh, well, which is why the project before. is before you today. Well, no, it said that it did require it until that expired, and you're asking us to change this to get rid of that requirement instead of making you get a CDP. They, they should be joined. Uh, we'll, we'll check with that. Well, my, my understanding is that this project uh, does not require the road winding. Uh, I understand that there is uh, perhaps an agreement with uh, MOHOA to have the two projects go hand in hand um, and, and to be processed, you know, uh, at the same time. But my understanding is the fire department does not require uh, the winding of the road for this project. But as my other reading of it, and I can't reread it right now, was that it was required, and now they want to take it away. 
So somebody decided when they gave that CDP that it was required for this project, and they were tied together. Okay? Now we're saying, oh, well, it doesn't matter. Let's untie them. Now, I have another question, and that is the, the bathroom is designed, and this whole CDP is limited to 25 years life, 25-year life. And as far as I can tell, the only reason that for that is it's going to get flooded in 25 years. So, number one, one of the counselors asked a question, what happens when it does? Okay. Is there a bond by MRCA to remove the same way there is on the jihad on Broad, if I say that right, on Broad Beach? You've got to remove this when you do that. There appears to be nothing in here that says 25 years from now, the waves are going to be washing through this bathroom, according to our staff, and therefore we're only giving a permit for 25 years, and after that it's silent. Something has to happen when that happens. As Skyler said, we don't want abandoned bathrooms on the beach. And we are supposed to, according to the Coastal Act, plan for a 100-year life. The only reason I can see that it was made 25 because that's where they wanted to put it. Okay, so we need an answer to that. And it says, it says, gee, in 25 years, you're going to have to raise the, the seawall. You're going to have to raise the uh, retaining wall. You're going to have to raise the bathroom. Well, if that's true... The Coastal Commission requires you to do it now, not 25 years from now. And, this, and the MOHOA doesn't want to get stuck with that expense. I would assume, but there's nothing in this whole staff report that says who pays for it. Who, you know, they own it, but who pays okay. for it? I've so I would, I'd that. like to have that answered. Um, mainly, I don't see a sea rush study. I don't see a sea rise study. I don't see anything. It's just a statement by somebody that, oh, it's only 25 years because that's where it is. Uh, that doesn't cut it. Um, now, so, so you would want to receive more clarification on whether how they're mitigating the 100-year requirement? Yeah. Okay. Because they say right in the staff report they are not mitigating it. Um, the other thing is security. Okay. I don't live at, on sea level, but I do know that there have been quite a few robberies there. And there's two things that I worry about. One, they have the bathroom automatically lock with a timer. Okay, and I know from being on, on the president of the board of the Adamson House, we get transients living in our bathroom. And so you got some guy sleeping there at night, and at 10 o'clock, it locks him in. Okay? You got to make sure things like that don't happen because. You know, you have to more detail this. Now, I'm in Riviera 1, and all the Rivieras on Point Doom have little key taps, okay? And if somebody uses it, we know who did it, okay? So if you have a robbery, because there's no reason why somebody can't get on that beach, go up and leave whenever they feel like, or somebody slips them a key, or et cetera, and, and you've left it wide open because there's nobody going to close it when you put a rock behind it. That's what they do. So I think you, they need to present a, a crime-attuned method of security. security, okay? The other thing, especially on West Sea level, where there's really nobody there uh, most of the time. Uh, but, and they can walk right around to regular sea level, or whatever you want to call it, east sea level, and get out. Uh, and I think that's, that's something that is doable. It's, it's done all the time. And, and uh, by just saying, gee, you can get out after 10 o'clock if you live there, doesn't mean that somebody else can't get out. Uh, and that's what's happening. Um, so, so that's... Anything else? Uh, let me just look here real quick. No, but I do think that we, we have to make it clear that we're not changing the access to that, that it's as deeded as MRO or whatever it is. Now, the other thing I think is people, somebody brought up uh, maintenance. And 
we all know there's no maintenance. All right, I shouldn't say we all know, but it's pretty obvious if you've lived in Malibu for a while. Um, I think that some agreement has to be made between the MRCA and the Homeowners Association. If they don't maintain it, the Homeowners Association can maintain it and charge them, just like the county does on maintaining your brush or, or virtually other, every, every other Homeowners Association I've known. Patrick, is that something that we can inter really intervene with or no? Can we require somebody to make an agreement with an adjacent homeowners association? Well, we're, what I, my point yeah. is, just before right. you answer, my point is they are required to maintain it. So they have their own cops. And, and there, so if there they is don't do it, somebody's got to do it. Correct. So there's a CUP in play, too. So maybe. Right, correct. I mean, we, we, there's the, the, the conditions of, as you said, maintenance, which are, which are valid. I mean, I think yeah, we should put yeah, typically respectful we, conditions in right. there of maintaining a bathroom, right. having then, regular trash pickup. Correct. And so typically what we, we don't get into the granular level of detail of you must contract with person A, B, or C to fulfill them. So your point's well taken, albeit maybe not to the specificity or granularity that you that you desire. Well, the, all the granularity I need is is they're building this. They're supposed to maintain it so right. that you don't fall down the stairs. And... Uh, they're supposed to keep it clean. That's it. If if they don't do that, somebody has to be have the legal right to take action. Okay. Um, Dennis, I'm going to go to you in one second. Robert had a question about clarifying the access for number four, and I got a little bit confused on that. I just wanted to make sure that the improvements that were for the access at number four was just the keypad and some signage. They're not redoing the gate. Is that correct? That would be west east sea level access. Uh, that's what our understanding is. Okay. You see, they already have a right to that gate, so. I know that they already had a right. Well, we can't he asked really a say. specific question about. So they may be changing the gate a little bit. I'm not sure. Okay. Um, Dennis. The fact that every time we have to talk about MRCA and we have to remind them that they have to take care of their stuff is pretty problematic. I mean, they've got a lot of people and Lord knows they have money, but we have to remind them to clean up after themselves. And now they want to do more work for the owners and everybody else. I walked with Doug Cohen down there to the stairs that day and there was trash down there. I, I, and a beer can, actually. And so I just don't know why we have to have that in that conversation of, of doing this. It's it's ridiculous. And and Mr. Haney's right on the bathroom as I switch gears here a little bit. It's on piles. But, you know, I can't build anything down that close. And you can't build anything down that close. And they're going to put these stairs, and they've got a couple of caissons they're going to put in. I don't get to back a cement truck up and bring down a hose to do all that. So they've got, to me, with them working on stairs like this, they don't maintain them. So now they're in a major structure situation, and I can't do that. As a contractor, I can't go down and all of a sudden just, you know, fix these stairs up like that. You're supposed to maintain them. You're allowed to do that, but they have let everything go as always, be it winding way east. I don't care where it is. They don't get to it. So for for us to get to this point, uh, well, OK, we're going to start a new project. We'll click and we'll clean all this up now. You know, we're we're going to be in there anyway and it's we'll make it nice and we'll do. All, but but OK, you got a set of stairs that I walk down also. And and the, the treads, they're like this. So, yeah, I, I'm they they prove nothing with me and I'm I'm. This is my starting my 14th year right now this month of co coming to these meetings, and I've been hearing their name for a long time, and I'm not seeing anything good come out of this. I mean, I, I, I get it. You know, they're going to do a couple things, but, you know, they're just just because we have to talk about them. That's a problem. And after all this time, we're still talking about them, about what they don't do, and we have to remind them what they have to do. Not good. Uh, one last comment. Go ahead, John. Yeah, uh, on, on the question they brought up about uh, machinery on the beach, 
and whose beach it is, and they own the beach. Uh, I, I was president of uh, Riviera One for 17 years, and we put one little sign down on the beach, and we own the beach, okay? We own 1,250 feet of beach. We have a deed. Steve Hudson came down, said, I don't care if you have a deed. You have to prove where the mean high tide line is, and you can't do it. So we own the beach, okay? That's the answer to that question. As far as the Coastal Commission is concerned, there is no private beach. Even though they say there is, on any given day, you have to prove where it is. And so that that argument that they own the beach, they don't own the beach, okay? Nobody does. I, we'll just add something onto that. I think that that was in uh, number 29 where they reference beaches and harbors. You may want to say beaches and harbors or others. You wouldn't be using beaches and harbors to access that part of the beach. You would be using probably the Army Corps of Engineers or the state. So uh, references, is, I think it's number 29. Yeah. So we should have it say, if it's just a, even if that's going in other projects as a, just a blanket statement, it should say beaches and harbors or other, you know, state or federal agency or something. The state, the state lands commission has jurisdiction up to the mean high tide line. There you go. Thank you, Norm. Um, I think it's also a reference to number 30. Sorry, I made a note about that. Uh, okay. Anything else that we want to see brought back with I've got, us? I've got a list of things. Okay, let's do it. So, okay. Um, picking up on that and talking about the, the ownership status of the Resnick parcel and the easement and how all that inter interacts, one thing that would be helpful on the, sort of on the other side of the coin there is with that mean high tide line, what, if any, beneficial use do they have of that property? Is it, is it maybe it's all entirely state lands uh, jurisdiction? What is the... Do they have any possible use that's distinguishable from the public use there already? I think if they haven't given a lateral access easement away for the public, they probably still have some right to that land and telling people that they cannot touch it. And there might be a foot of beach above the mean high tide line that they could put an umbrella on and tell people to go away? The mean high tide line is the average of the tides ca calculated yeah, yeah, yeah. over the course of 18 point something years or whatever, and it's just never going to be calculated. Sorry, 19.6. I was wrong. Yeah, the, the Cerro cycle. Anyway. I've had to deal with that one in court, too. <laughs> okay, so uh, just to, to clarify the, the ownership interests in that little patch. Next, we still don't have elevations of the retaining wall, especially Area 2, which is strange because we have a, a retaining wall height variance in play here, and we don't have an, a, a, an elevation drawing. And I think maybe they, when they said, oh, we did include an elevation, maybe they meant... They have a plan view that has elevation contours drawn on it, but that's a different thing. It's a, elevation is a side view. Um, I mentioned the fire department review is blank. Um, I would like some clarification on if we say the beach is not a formal park, so this is from the staff, if, so it doesn't need a CDP, what precedent might that be setting for Sycamore Park? Is this somehow distinguishable in being more formal, or, or is that more formal of a park than this is? And uh, the planning department changed their mind about the distinction here. I'm, I'm fuzzy about it. I'd like to know why they changed their mind. I don't know if that's something to answer now or to just put on the list and come back with. Yeah, there was some question about, um, Richard, do you know what I'm talking about? Yes, this is actually something that goes back to the previous director. Beach access is allowed, and that is what this is. A, a The park that you are referring to, uh, to me, is a, a different animal uh, because that, is, you know, there was a picnic bench installed, yeah. uh, facilities uh, that were for passive recreation, if you will. Uh, the goal of this project is to provide access to the beach, which per the uses table is something allowed on this parcel. And that was the primary de determining. Okay, accident. so it's well, distinguishable. Maybe we don't need more on well, that. Well, let me ask a question on that. Isn't a bathroom different than beach access? <laughs> That's a different question. <laughs> I mean, I, then you put in a picnic table, and you, it, it's not a park, but you throw in a bathroom and a stairway and it is a park? It doesn't make any sense. The the code doesn't discuss what are accessories to beach uses. Uh, the staff's 
uh, where we came up, where staff fell on this one and looking at it was that the restroom itself was not a, uh, a driving force uh, in the purpose of the project. The purpose of the project here is a staircase to get folks to the beach and parking spaces to get people to the beach. And that was the driving force, uh, the so, intention, if you will. So if we wanted to, we could say no bathroom. That would be within the commission's purview to so maybe provide any me. sort of comments like that. One of my questions on my list that follows on that was, some more clarity on distinguishing how a public restroom fits within single family medium zoning. Um, this is not access per se. Uh, they're allowed quote unquote improvements to access, but I would say this is, isn't access, it's, it's an amenity. It's a convenience so you don't have to pee in the ocean or whatever, but it's not about can you get to the beach or not. Um, nobody pees in the ocean. That's only you. You're the only one. It's getting warmer, sir. It's, it's sea level is rising. Um, we're all going to be doing it more often. Um, okay, on my list here, continuing, I mentioned the traffic uh, collision traffic study <coughs> that was mentioned that we haven't seen. Um, <coughs> with respect to geology, we're lacking some detail here. Um, a couple things. One, a few houses down on on. East Sea Level Drive, we have a lot of history about the bluff sliding, needing retaining walls there. We've heard all that within the last couple of years. Uh, emergency permits, huge retaining walls. Um, on its face, this looks like it might be a continuation of the same geological formation. Uh, there is the pro forma geotechnical review sheet, but there, I don't see a geology report. It would be nice if the ge geologist could characterize this. Is it the same? Is it different than the part that is problematical for the neighbors there? Um, and related to that, there's a concern uh, noted on page 16 of the staff report regarding perched water condition, the famous thing we've heard about in Big Rock, um, that said, well, that'll be left to the environmental health department. but. It seems like we might want to know about that sooner, especially if there's a factor of safety thing going on there. Um, you know, we're, t we're talking, we have a variance for building on steep slopes here. There's no discussion of the factor of safety, stability. Um, it just seems like a big hole in the, in the analysis there. Next, um, I'm, I'm unclear on what, if any, ADA uh, underlying requirement applies here, how far it goes. It seems to me that Surely you don't have to have ADA access for every beach and every coast everywhere. And if, like, for example, um, if you don't have it in somewhere in Big Sur where there's a trail down to the beach, why would you need it here? We are a rural area. This isn't a city. I, it would just be nice to know what the what is the controlling law there that says there is or isn't a requirement, and if the, there's a requirement, what exactly is it? Um, I mean, it's it's a nice thing to do, but then you wonder, well, you know, how many wheelchairs are we going to get down there? That, in, in terms of the overall benefit to the public, and does that is that an equitable thing? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. I don't know. On the, the grading, no grading has been specified. They expressly said there will be none, but the LCP defines grading as quote any excavation or fill or combination thereof. They're doing a lot of caissons and digging things out. There is grading. Yes, it's. Uh, under um, what's the cover the the under structure grading and and we're told that um, I don't know it seems like we we want to hear we want some numbers on that and that ties into the geology and how much are we really affecting things there now I'd like to hear more about the project lifespan because we, we're hearing 20 to 25 years and so, yeah, this, the whole scenario there needs some kind of rehab and with the safety of the stairs. Um, uh, certainly things need to be fixed. But I, if we're talking 20 to 25 years, I start to question the need for massive monolithic concrete construction and uh, steel handrails and all that. That's, that's, that lasts, you know, hundreds of years. And I would think that I would want to know why they're not taking a cue from the stairway that the state has just done at Point Doom, which is, yeah, it's got concrete caissons and so forth, the understructure, but the whole superstructure of that is timber. 
And if they're going to have to dismantle something in 25 years, it would be nicer if, and, and it would look nicer and feel more rustic than having the massive concrete monolithic thing. And, and I have to say, um, by way of comparison, the MRCA recently uh, revamped the little sort of pocket down below my house that's, uh, we call it Figment Cove, but they have mistakenly labeled it as Maritime Rocks. That was functioning nicely for the public before they got there, and there's only sand at limited times of the year. There is some there now because it tends to accumulate at the end of the season, and then when the storms come, it gets washed away again. But um, people were using it. Now they put in the giant monolithic concrete stairs and a nice, fancy sort of steel fence in front of it, and now it just feels like a prison, and literally nobody ever goes there. It's just, it looks like it's off limits. So uh, that that is more in the realm of design philosophy, but in any case, I'd like to hear some justification why they're going so heavily on the land there with the concrete, especially since concrete production is the third highest category of CO2 emissions in the world. You know, we're talking about gr the state has greenhouse rules and so forth. It's, it's third only behind energy production and transportation. And the next category is concrete production. So let's, let's think twice about that aspect of it. Um, for area two, we've got that big retaining wall. It's not just a wall, it's, it's got some volume to it with the uh, observation platform up above. That whole thing needs to be demolished before it can rebu be, re be rebuilt. There should be a demolition permit in here that's looking at how much of that is getting destroyed, where it's being taken away to, how are they getting that off the beach? Um, that, that's, that's a big mass of material there that is all just rotted and cracked and the, the, the rebar and whatever is showing is in bad shape. That's all gonna be going away. Um, I'm wondering what can the neighbor there, Alibrandi, what can they be doing with the easement that's being transferred to them in exchange? Does that enable some further development there or what is that? I don't know if that's a concern with this permit, but if, if they're getting some rights there, it would be interesting and maybe helpful for us to know what this, that transfer would enable there. Um, John mentioned the wave uprush stuff. That seems a little bit short. Um, uh, the restroom, did we talk about this? What is sort of like the ADA access question? Um, you know, what is the actual legal requirement? The same here, what, what is the requirement exactly that says a public toilet block is required on, on every beach? Could you say, well, we've got toilets at Zuma or whatever, so we don't need them here. If, if you need it here, do you need one on every beach in Big Sur? Or what, what is the, actually the legal framework that says this, this is or isn't required here? Because I think a lot of people around yeah, there. There's a lot of, if you go to the west of Malibu and to the Ventura area of Malibu, you see a lot of beach and beach accesses that are, exist there and there's no bathrooms. Yeah. With a lot more parking than this area. And you know, I think people, the public in general, understands how to go out to nature and go hiking and go places and uh, that the, they may be going somewhere where there isn't a bathroom. And Are you referring to an aqua turd? <laughs> you seem fixated on this. <laughs> um, no, but you know, there, there, or, or maybe there are other alternatives, composting toilets or other things that don't necessarily need a whole leach field. Or, the state know. uses composting toilets at a lot of their bathrooms. I don't think that that would be a wise use adjacent to the neighbors unless they wanted to. Maybe not. There's I, the I'm old just... joke about Malibu where it's the swell hits the smell. <laughs> but I think the neighbors are looking to avoid that at all costs. Yeah. Um, Leach Field, my papers are out of order now. That may co constitute all my questions for further info. And we'll call it, we'll, we'll call it done. Okay, Jeff, anything else? Uh, Dennis, anything else? No. John. I want to make a quick comment. Um, I have a house in Laguna. They put in a million and a half dollar stairway down to the beach next to my house. Uh, it involved uh, almost 400 stairs. And they were totally exempt from ADA because cities can 
request exemption and they're exempt. So you may, the law may have changed in the last seven years, but uh, same thing holds true of many other stairways on the coast. They do not have elevators and things like that for ADA. So you'd like to get clarification as to what the ADA requirements are for beach access? Well, Craig asked that. I'm just giving information that other cities do it. So there must be a way. All right. uh, I'm going to move that we continue this item to a date uncertain uh, and have staff bring it back to the commission when the eight questions are answered. I'll second. Everybody in favor of this? Aye. I am. I am. Okay. Aye. Aye. All right. I move we adjourn. I second that. Well done. Have a good evening, everybody. Are we good? We're good.